All right. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining and thanks for the introduction. So I will give another introduction, um, namely about deep learning. So first of all, a little bit about my person. So my name is Philip Singer. I work for H2O now for around one and a half years. I live in Vienna, Austria. And I have been very active on the competitive data science pla platform Kaggle over the last few years. So I thought it's a good chance to also make the connection to deep learning by going a bit into my background on the platform and then going through a few use cases that um, are prominent in the general, um, general area and also that have been prominent on, on Kaggle. Yeah, so on Kaggle, um, my highest rank on Kaggle has been number one, um, and currently I'm ranked third. And a lot of the competitions and the, uh, the data science problems that are part of Kaggle nowadays are done with deep learning. So what is deep learning? Um, deep learning can be seen as a subclass of machine learning. Um, it usually is based on neural networks. So deep learning is just another term for specific types of neural networks, namely any type of neural network with multiple layers can be actually called deep learning. But the term has kind of emerged as a new way of calling uh, training models with new neural networks as kind of deep learning. Um, the main idea of deep learning is that you try to progressively extract higher level features from raw input. And we will see this in, in, the, um, in the figure below in a second. And it has specifically done breakthrough in applications to new types of data. So with new types of data, I mean um, mostly unstructured data. So like images, text, audio, video, um, in contrast to more classical um, types of data like tabular data, but also in tabular data nowadays, deep learning plays a very, very important role. So it, as I said, deep learning is mostly about neural networks. And in this figure we see um, in the 1980s era of neural networks, we usually had very, very shallow neural networks, specifically also tailored um, due to the, um, the restrictions in computing power um, is that usually you just had um, a kind of input layer, a hidden layer and the output layer. And that's how a very simple perceptron or a very simple neural network would look like. You have some input features, you have some kind of neural um, layers, and then you have some kind of output layer. And the output layer represents, the, for example, an image, as we can see on the right-hand side, as a type of higher level feature extraction. So let's say we have this input, as you can see on the right-hand side, which could be an image. And then we have a deep neural network with several different uh, layers, several different sub networks. And the idea of these neural networks is that they can identify um, different levels of features in a sense. So for example, the first layer might identify edges. The next layer might identify combinations of edges. The next might be might identify features and then combinations of features. And the final output layer would um, then, for example, here um, output charge. Of course, this is a very simplification of the whole general um, workings of deep learning and neural networks. But in a nutshell, to summarize here, deep learning is based on neural networks and usually Deep means multiple layers and multiple uh, stacks of neural networks. Very short hist history because yeah, we, we, we mostly talk about, um, about uh, neural networks and deep learning just for the last few years, but the history is actually quite long. So in 1943, there was the first concept of a neural network. And then in 1958, so it took quite some time, it was the most simple neural network that could be trained, which was the perceptron. And in only 1974, uh, the back propagation, which is kind of the training routine that is also used nowadays to train neural networks has been developed. And then there was um, actually two AI winters and you might've heard about it, which, was, which were timeframes between 1974 and 1980 and 1987 and 1993, very, very little research and very little 
progress in deep learning and specifically also generally artificial intelligence and machine learning has taken place. And this was mostly due to very restrictions in terms of uh, computing power, very restrictions in terms of how these models can be trained. And only um, then later, the last few years, we saw a real acceleration first uh, in terms of functionality and methodology for deep learning, like maximum pooling, LSTMs and RNNs for uh, um, NLP problems, um, then GPUs, and we will also hear about GPUs later in, the, in this talk from NVIDIA, um, transformer uh, um, architectures, again for NLP, um, which all accelerated, really accelerated this uh, deep learning research and progress. And if you're somehow also trying to stay up to date in, in the last few years, um, now we have real applications, heavy res research and constant development. So every day something new is coming out at, uh, nowadays and the field is moving very, very fast. Um, yeah, applications, just a few, um, where sometimes people don't directly see how deep learning is involved. But for example, something very prominent is Alexa, Siri, Cortana, where you speak, then your speech is transformed to text. So this is already done deep by deep learning. And then the text uh, needs to be transformed to some action, for example, which would be again, uh, deep learning related. So. Uh, speech to text and text to intent, for example, would be both separate uh, uh, strong and NLP deep learning applications. Autonomous driving, obviously, we all know uh, what is going on in this area with Tesla and other players nowadays. So here it's more about image data, right, and video data. So for example, one part of this whole um, endeavor is to do car object detection on videos and videos are just images mostly. Um, so you can split up a video by frame and then you have images and you're back to image object detection. This would be another deep learning application. Yeah, if you use one of these uh, popular apps like uh, TikTok, Instagram, um, Facebook and so on and so forth, you usually have this kind of filters, right? You can overlay over your image and it, and it looks funny. For example, here are some anime filters. And those are also usually um, stemming from the area of deep learning with um, uh, so-called GANs. So this is another, another aspect where we uh, are in contact with deep learning uh, in, on, on a regular basis. Yeah, this is maybe something that not we are um, in, in touch with, but the whole area of uh, reinforcement learning, it's called, which there was a big breakthrough uh, um, 2016 with AlphaGo. Uh, so the first um, artificial intelligence that could beat a top player in Go. So the chess of our times in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of way, uh, chess AI of our times. And yeah, in deep learning, I just want to emphasize here on this slide, the constant improvements and the constant research that is going on. So ImageNet is uh, the most popular uh, image training data set where a lot of these pre-trained models in the area of image uh, classification, regression and so on are pre-trained. And um, this is also a popular benchmark data set. And we could see that in 2010, which was the competition's first year, uh, every team got at least 25% wrong. And this is just, yeah, 11 years ago, right? So not that of a long time. In 2012, so two years later, um, the team to first use deep learning was the only team to get the error rate below 25%. So before it was mostly just extracting classical features from the images like color, uh, and so on and so forth, and then running classical uh, machine learning approaches. And then with deep learning, starting from 2012, the first team got the error rate below 25. Um, the following year, every team got below 25. And if we go further and further, this is actually already a uh, um, uh, couple of years old. In 2017, 
uh, 29 of 38 teams got less than 5% wrong. And nowadays the error rate is even lower. And um, always when we, when we talk about new state of the art, it's usually measured on, on, on this data set. And there's constant progress and so many different techniques nowadays that you can use and that are at your disposal. As a final slide, um, because I started my talk talk with Kegel, and this is just an overview of all the different of some of the different types of competitions I have done on on Kegel, and just very roughly to give you again, even though we covered some of you some of the use cases, is uh, how deep learning applies to the to different problems. And actually, in all of these competitions, I used some form or another of of deep learning. So the first one. Uh, Google landmark recognition would be about detecting similar landmarks. So imagine having a picture of a landmark and you need to find similar images of landmarks. So sometimes like with, I think Google lens or something it's called, uh, you, you can, or if you do a Google search for an image, you, you, you upload an image, right? And it tries to find similar images. So all that involves uh, image deep learning technologies. Um, the next one would be about um, uh, set, um, 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 data from, from space. And you need to detect, this is a bit of a synthetic <laughs> competition about uh, extraterrestrial signals, but a lot of the signal data nowadays, and also um, the next one with rainforest uh, audio detection. So a lot of this uh, signal and audio data nowadays, um, a good technique is to transform these data to image data and then run image uh, models, for example. Yeah, NLP, the next one is NLP. So NLP is definitely has, a, has seen a lot of progress the last few years with transformers, with very large, you might have read about these very, very large models, which in practice are not used, but um, they're used in, in, in search and so on. Um, yeah, uh, so a lot of progress with NLP and deep learning with transformers. Um, lift motion prediction for autonomous vehicles that was also about um, some kind of um, um, driving cameras and driving sensors predictions, earthquake prediction, and then some of my favorite competitions about NFL. So for example, predicting the last one, predicting uh, object detection based on cameras on, on the field and then trying to predict the camera, uh, the, the helmets and trying to predict impact of helmets. The one before was about predicting how far um, a Russia will run. So without going here into detail, just as a kind of overview that deep learning has so many applications in so many different areas nowadays. And it also uh, fosters kind of the creativity because um, you, you can really apply different techniques to tasks you don't think they're useful in the beginning. But the more classical settings are image and uh, NLP with applications in video, uh, audio, and many other areas. So yeah, with that, um, my introduction um, to deep learning is, is, is finished. And I'm handing over to my colleagues to talk more about uh, AutoML in deep learning. Thank you. So thank you, Osana, and thank you, uh, uh, Philip. So I'm going to continue the discussions on the uh, auto ML deep learning, uh, on the use cases, perspectives, and benchmarking. So before we proceed, let me just quickly and uh, briefly introduce myself. So I came to Singapore from uh, Malaysia in 2012, worked for Teradata before moving on to Hong Kong to work for Bank of America. And uh, in 2020, I returned to Singapore to uh, join H2O. So while I'm in Hong Kong, so I, I did some part-time teaching at the University of Hong Kong, and I'm currently the visiting lecturer at Monash University for the course Molecular Biology. So this is the, uh, my, my first ML uh, lessons in 2012, the cornerstone of my career, changed to enter the world of machine learning. So I'm going to cover four segments uh, today and uh, primarily focusing on the uh, driver's AI, a platform that you can uh, build a machine learning model without writing codes. Uh, so, and I have a use cases to company, a company. And uh, so two from the natural language processing and two from computer vision. So I'm going to wrap up with uh, some uh, benchmarking uh, results uh, using uh, GPU. So let's start with the uh, deep learning. 
uh, on a computer vision. So in driver's AI, so you can do uh, uh, one of the two uh, types of uh, computer vision. One is the called image model, where you have an image and you have a label attached to it. So another type is called image and transformer. You have image, yeah, if a target in between, you have uh, 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 other features, it, it can be a uh, categorical, it can be a numeric uh, a column as well. So for image model, you can do binary classifications, for example, dog and cat and, or multiple class classification, dog, cat, or maybe mouse. And for image transformer, you can do uh, 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 likewise binary classification, uh, multiple class classification plus uh, regression as well. So later we are going to look at uh, one of the use cases built in uh, uh, using regression computer vision on computer vision. So these are the uh, uh, three three models that comes uh, bundled with the driver's AI. So on the uh, uh, NLP front, so you also have uh, two uh, uh, options. Uh, this time you can do uh, one of these two or, or you can do both. Uh, so on this side, you have a TensorFlow. So under TensorFlow, you can do a classic convolutional neural network or the classic recurrent neural network. Uh, for both, you can choose word-based or character-based or both at the same time. So on the on the on the on this uh, front, so you have a PyTorch uh, bird model. So PyTorch bird model in the driver's AI has uh, some of these uh, uh, pre-trained models uh, built in. Um, so under Py PyTorch model, uh, like uh, uh, similar to uh, computer visions, so you can have NLP only or NLP a transformer where uh, in a NLP only. So you have a text column, uh, uh, example like a Twitter text and a Facebook text, and you have a target. And uh, so for NMP transformer, you have a text, you have a target, and in between you have uh, 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 other columns, other features. It can be categorical, it can be numerical. So all, all this uh, model, be it uh, the classic one or the uh, uh, bird-based models, you can do binary classification, multi-class classification, and regression. So let's start with the first use case on an, uh, at NLP on uh, uh, detecting the cipher text. So let's look at the what uh, ciphertext is. This, is. this is an example of ciphertext. So ciphertext are messages that you use algorithm to encrypt and then you send to another person. So the, per so the person who received that encrypted messages uh, would use an algorithm to decrypt to, in order to reveal uh, the content of the message to see uh, what you're trying to tell him. Yeah, so, and, uh, so a ciphertext like the uh, uh, base 64 algorithm has uh, some of this uh, standard property. So ciphertext uh, can also be used by uh, the ill intent images in order to, uh, for example, smuggle uh, information out of an organization or smuggle information like into our organizations for malicious intent, for example. So, um, so this use case was, uh, as we built this use case for a government organization for in charge of the national security. So in building this uh, use case, so we receive uh, uh, a data set containing uh, email messages. So these are the legitimate uh, actual email messages. So what we did was we actually um, uh, insert a very randomly selected uh, some of the email messages and inserted the, uh, the cipher text at random positions inside those uh, selected uh, email messages. And as a result, those uh, email messages that receive the cipher text would be labeled as one and those that did not receive uh, uh, the cipher message will be labeled as zero. So this data set will then be sent to the uh, driver's AI platform to build uh, a binary classification model in order to detect if a particular incoming email message or outgoing email message uh, contains uh, uh, malicious contents uh, such as a cipher text. So this is uh, uh, the artifacts that you can get from the driver's AI upon completions of your uh, model to evaluate like, how good your model is. So it comes with uh, the standard uh, AUC uh, graph. And then, so uh, this is the accuracy score, which is about uh, 84%. And uh, over here, this is, uh, we use a, a PyTorch model to build this uh, a model. And so this is uh, the, the, the various inter iterations that the driver's AI use uh, uh, the underlying uh, algorithm is a genetic algorithm. So in each uh, uh, iterations, so drivers I would perform like, uh, you create uh, multiple models and then at the end, you find the best model for you. Okay, so this is an example of a one way on how to improve the models. For example, um, like I increased the, uh, the, the time uh, setting. The time setting is referring to the iteration, the number of iterations. So uh, the time setting of four could mean like 100 iteration, three could mean like 60 iterations. So depending on the data yeah, that you, feel, you, you put in. 
So by increasing the, uh, the iterations, so what we uh, found out is that we uh, uh, significantly uh, improved like the F1 score uh, and also the true positive score and uh, those uh, undesirable metrics like the false positive or false negative. So, so also reduced, yeah. Okay. Now, so uh, let's uh, go to the next uh, use case, which is uh, uh, on uh, how to use the deep learning uh, combined with the natural language processing to uh, better understand your customers. Okay. So in this use case, since these are the data, uh, that, we are, that we have used to build a uh, model. So let's uh, go through uh, what, what are the things that we can find from this data. So we have a, we have a text column. This is the, the, the free text that we want to uh, perform NLP on using deep learning. And we have a column called uh, topic label. So this is also a target column. Yeah. So as you can see, this target column has several categories. So this is actually a customer complaint. So this is customer complaint from uh, actually from the US telco company. And uh, so you see there are, there are quite a number of uh, categories. Yeah, uh, bill and services, complain about speed and so on. So this target is uh, very well suited for multi-class classification. So if you build this uh, model, then you can uh, predict or detect if a particular complaint belongs to a, a, a certain category that you can forward to a relevant department. And this column, it has a sentiment score, which is a continuous variable. So this continuous variable is the magnitude of the sentiment. So that means how upset your customer is based on the, uh, the, the comment. So, and uh, from the, uh, the availability of uh, this continuous variable enables you to build a regression model. So you can, uh, when you forward this message to a relevant department, you can also give them a heads up like uh, how upset is uh, uh, this customer is. And then with the same continuous variable combined with the times column, then you can build a time series. And to, to do, for example, a surgery or even tactical analysis on the trend of the sentiment. Okay. Okay. So this is the, the list of the model. So each of these model, an LTLP model on the uh, customer complaint. So all these models were uh, done, were completed on a single day. Uh, using uh, different approaches. For example, uh, so these two, so I, I prefer, I wanted to uh, see how good it is if I use a convolution neural network, word only, and uh, I use the same, but I combine, I, I do both word and uh, characters. And uh, what about uh, just a uh, recurrent neural network alone, or word alone, or word automated? The way automated means you let a uh, driver say, I pick which one is the best. Yeah. So this one is, I only uh, uh, want a particular uh, 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 per case. And just to recap that, so in uh, NLP, you can use choose a PyTorch or TensorFlow, or you can let the driver's AI decide, you put in auto, auto, and then driver's AI will uh, uh, decide for you. Or you can uh, enforce uh, uh, both. Let's say I want to do both at the same time, you switch it on, switch it on, or you just one of them. So you can switch it off, uh, switch on this one, or switch off this and switch on this. So it's, uh, it's your choice. Yeah. And the rest, you leave it to uh, driver's AI. Yeah, so now this is uh, this slide is about, uh, now you know, uh, you understand a little bit about customer. How do you better uh, understand your customer who speak like multiple uh, languages? So this is where you can, uh, you might want to, uh, or you pre prefer to use certain word embedding uh, that, that, that is able to detect like multiple languages. One example is a fast text that can detect like 157 uh, languages. Uh, so uh, how do you, uh, make use of this if you're interested to use this inside the driver's AI. So it's a very, very simple step. So all you need to do is identify uh, which word embedding you want to use. Uh, fast text, you go to fast text and download. So once you're downloaded, you get a gun zip file. What do you need to do with gun zip file? Nothing. You just transfer it to a uh, uh, server, your server that you have uh, driver's AI installed. And then inside the expert setting, just specify where you have a uh, place the Gansi file. That's all, that's all you need to do. So once you have uh, entered the uh, correct path, and then the driver's AI will refresh itself and uh, get itself ready to make good use of the, uh, this word embedding. So this is an example uh, of uh, multiple, a few models that I have built to compare with or without a word embedding. So uh, uh, what are the advantage of uh, having uh, a word embeddings uh, like GLOV or, or fast text? Uh, so, this type of word embedding, it has all the ingredient, necessary ingredient for you to build a very robust model. If you choose the, uh, the classic like a convolutional neural network or a uh, bird, bird model, uh, 
set to auto, then driver say I will actually uh, uh, train the model from scratch. Yeah. So because of this, if you use um, the word embedding, you generally your models will be completed or will be trained like, like much faster. So as indicated by the training time here. So with the word embedding, uh, so it took only like three minutes. Uh, without it, it's a uh, six to uh, about uh, thirty-six minutes. Yeah. Okay. Now we also uh, built a time series on on the uh, complaint data set. So so driver AI enables you to build like in say single experiment to build multiple time series for uh, different categories of complaints. Yeah. So this is the result. So you only need to run the experiment once. You specify. Uh, uh, which particular column that you want driver's AI to look for this unique category and build a separate time series for each. Uh, so here, uh, so let's look at the, do a bit of analysis. You see there's uh, two very, very uh, upset complaints uh, here. And you see the red one is a FCC. FCC is a regular reporting for, for Telco. Uh, so it makes sense because uh, you have to be really, really, really upset in order to like, bring the matters to a regulatory body. And if you can see, it, this is another really upset is a bill. Yeah, it also makes sense because uh, the thing that makes the customer really upset is the bill that like overcharge them also. So service and the speed, yeah, maybe not so you get over it uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, so further you can uh, now equip with the information of the trend. So you can actually uh, uh, perform further analysis uh, on this uh, time series uh, results. Uh, for example, like you can perform like periodic signal fitting, uh, meaning that, uh, uh, you want to find like uh, what is the uh, annual recurring like mood swing of your customers based on their, their complaints. So in this in this chart, so every year, so uh, uh, over the span of about twelve months, you see your customers uh, are the, the least upset in the month of uh, March, and they are most upset in the month month of uh, July and October. So based on this, so uh, some strategic decision can be made. For example, uh, deploy like more customers service agent approaching these months. All right, so we come to the segment of uh, computer vision. Yeah. Okay, so in computer vision, so let me start with uh, showing you the, uh, the, the data set for image only model. So here, so in more detail, so the image only model, so you have a column, which is your image, and you also have a label, that's all. Okay, so for uh, image transformer models, so you have a, your image column, so you have a, a target, this to target, and, and also, you have uh, some other uh, categorical or numeric columns as so, well. Okay, uh, so we are going to continue with these discussions. So this actually, the uh, uh, this use case is actually uh, a, um, a use case that uh, on the study of the heart functions, uh, cardiac functions from the echocardiography videos. Echocardiographies are special uh, purpose-built ultrasound machine for the heart. So you have heard that ultrasound machines are often used for uh, to scan babies. Uh, in the womb. So this one is ultrasound machine for the heart. Yeah. Uh, so this use is built on the invitations uh, from the Stanford University, the Stanford, the hospital side of the of the uh, the, the university. And uh, so this is the uh, so they have uh, implemented it at the at the hospitals to uh, study the, the the heart patients. And this is the uh, sample of the video that we have received. So this is the workflow on the building the. Uh, uh, the, the use case. Uh, so this is the, the video file and then we split the video into, into your, your individual images and then label it and then uh, train the model on that. Yeah. So, so this is the video and the video. So the, this video is showing the, the pumping uh, mechanism of the, the, left, the left chamber of the, of the heart. So what we want to measure is the, uh, the amount of blood. Uh, I build the model to measure or to estimate the amount of blood pump out from the left ventricle of the heart. So the starting the, the video is split into individual frame. So each frame is labeled accordingly accord, uh, on, on, on using the timestamp, yeah. Okay, so next, so this is the, the output, how the, uh, the, uh, the model performed. So in regression model, we use uh, uh, a metric such as a mean absolute error. So you can see the, uh, the, the prediction error gradually uh, decline over time. Uh, okay, so, so what did we get? How, how, how did the uh, driver's AI compare to uh, what currently Stanford is uh, uh, using? So the error rate on the, uh, at, the at the Stanford hospital is the, uh, about 35 mil for, uh, 
for the diastolic volume and the system volume only at 25. And by using driver ZI, we are able to reduce the error even, even more, like more than 50%, down to 18 uh, milliliter and 12 milliliter with the help of uh, uh, driver ZI uh, functionality uh, that allow us to further fine tune the pre trained model and to increase the uh, uh, function of uh, dimension of the feature space with the help of GPU. Okay. So the next uh, uh, use case on the image will be the multi-class classification use case. This is this time is on the satellite images. So this is uh, a use case to, to predict or to de detect uh, from the satellite image what kind of uh, land use uh, that be uh, uh, is on, on the image. For example, is it agricultural, airplane buildings, uh, spot residentials, and dense residential forest and so on. So this data was uh, furnished by University of California Merced. And so this is the, uh, how the model performs, the accuracy, and also the, uh, this is the confusion matrix on the test set. So, so on this, this, this column, these columns are the uh, predicted, the predicted uh, uh, outcome of a various category. This is the actual outcome. So the diagonal, the yellow diagonal, these are the hits. So these are the correctly predicted ones. Yeah. So we want more numbers here instead of uh, on these two sides. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so again, so some uh, more examples of the uh, images. And so this is a grad cam. Grad cam is the explanations on the uh, why the, uh, the the model or the driver's AI uh, predicted this uh, image as an airplane. So it highlighted this part, which, which tells you that uh, the uh, driver CI model found uh, this area, found features in this area that uh, indicate that this is an airplane and found features in this area that indicates that this is a storage tank. And so uh, what about this one? This is the river, it found like, yeah, this one is the feature of a river. And uh, so this intersection, the lines and the roads here is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the telltale sign of uh, uh, intersections. Okay, so, so there are other uh, image classifications, uh, use cases that you can, uh, uh, that we, we have done, for example, for maritime security to detect if, it, if, there, if there are ships or, or just a, a coast and various uh, plant diseases, uh, specific disease or multiple disease on the manufacturing to de uh, detect the defects and also detect cancer, whether or not it's a malignant or a normal cell or benign cancer. Uh, so uh, let me conclude this by uh, uh, giving you some of the insight that we got from uh, GPU uh, benchmarking. Uh, so basically, this is a comparison of a deep learning model. Uh, how long does it take uh, to train a deep learning model by using a, a GPU or without using GPU? So uh, without using GPU, there's 20 plus hours and uh, with GPU 3.5 hours, difference of about 20 over hours. So this is uh, on the, uh, uh, the NLP, is about the three times uh, improvement. So this is a use case that we have uh, helped uh, our client to build a predictive maintenance model for a mining company on the uh, IoT data of uh, heavy machine learning. So by, by using just uh, CPUs, uh, so it took like 20 plus hours, uh, a bigger CPU, uh, slight improvement, but uh, if we use GPU, there's a significant improvement, like the difference of uh, 20 hours. All right, so that concludes uh, the uh, presentations of uh, use cases. And uh, so thank you for your attention. And coming up, so there's an, another poll. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, Bye. John. I'm just going to uh, flesh out <laughs> another final quick poll um, just to assess interest from the, uh, from the audience here on the free trial of the HTOP platform. So I'll leave it up for a few seconds, and then we'll uh, move it to the next speaker. Okay, thank you so much. So, Dr. Ratikan, over to you. Thank you, Oksana, and uh, thanks, Chong, and thanks, uh, Philips and Sandeep. Uh, I'm going to share about how GPUs are actually being used for AI and accelerated data science. Jong has given a very uh, deep insight up of different models. He has shared about NLP models for natural language processing. He shared about uh, computer vision models uh, for image uh, understanding, image segmentation, classification, and so forth. So beside natural language processing and also image, it, uh, GPUs are being used for all type of models, in, in, including uh, audio, 
type of model, which is basically we call it STT and TTS. So it cuts across different type of uh, AI and uh, deep learning and machine learning. And additionally, we also accelerate the data science in terms of um, text processing by speeding up what I call that as the parallel processing of text and string data. I'll share, what, share that late, uh, after this in the, as part of the uh, data science component. Uh, as you know, NVIDIA provides the hardware, which is GPU, which is general purpose graphical processing unit, which comes with uh, 10,000 over cores in a single GPU. And this GPU then interconnected with multiple GPUs making a system. For example, in a DGX, we have eight GPUs. So that these eight GPUs with each of them with 10,000 cores, which gives you about 80,000 cores with uh, almost um, 320 uh, giga byte of uh, what, I, what I call that is a high speed access memory in the GPU. We call it as a GPU RAM so that you can load your data in the GPU RAM and do real time in memory analytics, real time in memory AI model inferencing. So all this made possible because of the layers of libraries that we have enabled to do multi GPU and also multi node. That means eight GPUs in a single DGX can be connected uh, with multiple DGXs together. So that means you can connect to two DGX, four DGX, eight DGX. In, uh, in some of our cases, we have a customers up to 200 plus DGXs to train the model, which like Philip mentioned, right? These are the extremely huge models in order to train, for example, uh, Megatrons, in order to train uh, GPT-3, for example. Those are the algorithms where it's a complex algorithms, which comes with uh, hundreds of billions of parameters. Now, all these helps researchers like yourself, uh, uh, platform providers like H2O, so that they can build their automated auto ML type of uh, framework, which then can be used by developers to develop the end application. So NVIDIA is a full stack data center scale AI computing platform company. We provide the hardware, we provide the libraries and the frameworks for uh, companies like H2O to develop their own uh, framework, which helps the uh, data scientists to automate the whole process uh, to get the whole discovery and understanding of the data much easier using various techniques, including AI, ML, and DL. Uh, and so we have uh, what we call is uh, GPU cloud registry. You can even actually download H2O from our cloud registry, which basically is a repository of a lot of application, which is containerized. So H2O is a containerized, easy to manage, easy to use across multi-GPU and multi-node GPUs as well. And as I shared earlier, uh, H2O has a libraries and component where they can actually uh, ingest data, organize the data and put it in a structured way so that not only your algorithm get trained on the GPU for a specific framework. For example, it could be PyTorch, TensorFlow and then so forth uh, by using the API on our GPU across multiple node and multiple GPUs. They also actually process the data in uh, what I call that is uh, uh, data parallelization. So while the task is being executed in parallel, it could be a training in parallel, data also being uh, positioned such a way that the GPU could accelerate and uh, being processed in parallel. So all that is made possible because of the libraries and framework that we develop and give it free for everybody to take and use it. Now, if you can see in the last couple of years, MLPerf is an independent organization which publishes performance benchmark results for all the GPUs out there in the world. And NVIDIA is consistently uh, being a number one in the MLPerf benchmark results. Um, this is not only for deep learning type of algorithm implementation, it even includes machine learning algorithm. It could be for a random forest, it could be XGBoost, it could be any type of simple uh, reg regression type of algorithms able to be executed on a GPU. And also in the data analytics, for example, what I shared earlier, how the data is being ingested, it was actually stored in memory uh, before it executed in terms of data parallel execution. It could be a simple SQL query 
which get executed. So this is very important for tools like H2O so that they can ingest large amount of data set as it arrives in a real time or they read it from the memory so that they can continuously train the algorithm and also do an inferencing to detect a uh, certain type of segmentation, classification, or clustering that intended to. And you can see a detailed performance benchmark in our website where we have shared um, our results in terms of accuracy, throughput, time taken for different type of GPUs, for different type of frameworks and algorithms so that you can have a, a good representation of our benchmark results. Uh, this is just to share with you, for example, if you were to run a data science framework, including XGBoost from um, uh, H2O, right, you will see the performance difference by using uh, CPUs versus GPU, like what John has shared, it could be 20 times, it could be 40 times, or even in some cases, 100 times, because GPU is able to uh, uh, organize and then structure the data before the pipeline execution or parallel execution, a specific model executed in the GPU. So in this example where you have CUDA IO library, which actually able to pull the data in in a parallel uh, manner in a, using a data frame. So if you were to use a CPU, it may take up to about 2,741 uh, seconds to actually access the data, read the data, make it available for data parallelization. But if you use a 16A100 GPU, you can get it done within 22 seconds. Right, so that's a speed difference was between uh, 20 node of CPUs taking 2741 versus 22. Similarly, if you were to run the algorithm, XGBoost algorithm, the speed up is uh, you know X number of times as I shared in the slide, and also finally uh, is end-to-end uh, -end model training. So when I say end-to-end -end model training, which is combining the data access uh, in terms of uh, data preparation and then eventually execution the algorithm before end results being obtained. So you can see generally GPU gives you a better performance so that you can discover the inside of the data for data processing and algorithm execution end to end so that it actually shortens your time of discovery by using uh, H2O as your automated tool. Now these cuts across different type of workload. It could be tax analytics, for example, you could be an e-commerce company. You want to do page rank, uh, you know, from millions of, of pages or hundreds of millions or billions of pages that you are getting in and you want to do a page rank um, using, for example, simple graph and node type of algorithms. For example, it could be Louvain algorithm, right? So the, the, uh, the speed up you can see over here, um, it's always uh, x x times. This is uh, this is thirteen x times much faster. Uh, but large type of models, if you were to run, it is um, almost six times much faster between GPUs. Uh, we forget about a CPU comparison, but we look at within our family of GPUs. Uh, Volta V100 is about a two years old. Ampere, which came out last year, is performing six times much faster than V100. Um, so our GPU is a competition against each other. The previous generation is slower than the, the next generation. Uh, similarly, if you're going to do uh, inferencing, if you were to do it on A100, it is much faster than CPU for you to do inferencing. Uh, a quick note, if you're actually uh, ML enthusiast, DL enthusiast, and, and you are actually developing your own algorithms, you are actually having a license of uh, H2O, you want to get that executed, uh, you could actually start with as simple as using a GPU compute in a cloud, or you can actually start with your own uh, high-end PC, or you can actually have uh, enterprise desktop for your individual uh, model training, uh, model in inferencing, model evaluation, or you are a user of enterprise data center great facility where you can have different type of GPUs uh, from A30 to DGX station to DGX uh, A100. The, the important criteria, if you look at it at the bottom, as I highlighted, there is a memory that you have in order to train your data. So Jong actually mentioned in his uh, one of presentation about number of epochs. So when you're actually increasing number of epochs, per uh, training cycle. That means you need to make sure the data is available in the memory for a higher accuracy model training. So the larger the memory, uh, the better number of epochs that you can actually increase if it's required in your optimization techniques, or you can bring in more images, you can fit it into the uh, memory space so that you can actually train a larger data set with the higher accuracy 
of the model so that it can converge much faster in terms of the accuracy. Right. And a very important uh, point here, which I want to share with you, it is about having uh, enterprise grade data center so that you can run multiple mixed workload. So for those who are actually using applications like uh, H2O, you're not only using one single application, so you'll be using multiple applications for your entire uh, uh, data science type of activities. You are doing ETLing, you are preparing the data, you are doing a cleansing, you are doing a preparation. Uh, maybe there is a, a Kafka running at the back end, you are continuously uh, ingesting the data. And after you use H2O to train the model, you may do an inferencing. After inferencing being done, you may want to display and so forth. So we actually suggest uh, for you to use EGX platform, which is unified architecture, so that you can have a uh, uh, a single system which will have multiple mixed loads of uh, CPU, GPU type of application can run in a single architecture using a what we call NVIDIA EGX platform. So it is it, it could be uh, using uh, virtual machines or it can be based on a bare metal where you can run multiple of this application in a unified uh, manner for all your activities in the uh, in the lab or in the production environment for you to deploy. Now, one of the key uh, important factor why GPU is extremely fast, it's because of our architecture. So Ampere is our latest architecture where we use third generation Tensor Core. So Tensor Core is a dedicated hardware core which will accelerate the traversal of your network as it gets executed, which is uh, complex matrix multiplication. Right? And it has a second generation of RT core, if in case you are doing a virtualization, sorry, visualization of your images after you do certain type of uh, image processing using AI network. And also it, it comes to the multi-instant GPU, where the GPU is so extremely fast, uh, A100 can be virtually uh, um, shared into a seven GPUs, right? So as though you will have seven GPUs in order to execute seven different application in a single A physical A100. So that's where the mix capability, mix capability comes in. And uh, as you connect multiple GPUs in multiple nodes, you are actually having access to the NV link uh, and also NV switch, which gives you high throughput capability in terms of the access between multiple cores of multiple GPUs and multiple nodes gives you a mesh capability to do data parallelization and task parallelization. And finally, a feature called sparsity. A lot of algorithms where in terms of entropy distribution, it, it may be a highly sparse. If it is dense, it's very good. If it is a sparse, uh, we want to, we don't want to waste some of your bits uh, or your bytes where you know it's relatively keeping zeros, right? Um, in the, in terms of metric multiplication for uh, tensor core implementation, so the feature is basically uh, it makes sure the density of the AI uh, uh, network is being maintained, so that when it's executed, it actually takes a, a higher throughput cycle for data to be moved. Now, this is an example of how um, uh, MIC actually enables for you to run multiple different type of workloads in a single GPU, optimizing your uh, throughput and also uh, reducing your capex in terms of uh, uh, cost for your GPU uh, installation and usage in the data center. This is another simple example of a TF32, which I shared with you, rather than using a 32-bit in order to uh, execute uh, sparsely uh, uh, structured tensor by using uh, uh, TF32 uh, features. You just need 18 bits in order to execute, uh, you know, minusing the sign bit for you to execute a specific uh, computation in a GPU. So all this together uh, gives you a supercharged AI computing architecture that you can actually use in order to run application like H2O so that you can have a faster discovery of the information, the insight that you are looking for. So with that, I would like to uh, say thanks uh, to the invitation by H2O for me to share here. And uh, for more information about GPU, we can join to our developer program and learn about the GPU architecture. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Oksana.